An heirloom is a common family heritage that is passed on from one generation to another. It is said that these sacred items are instilled with divine blessings, protection and special energies of the ancestors that benefit the recipients. In Yogyakarta, a popular heirloom or pusaka is the keris, which is a unique Southeast Asian dagger. The modern version existed since the 14th century in the Malay archipelago and has since mesmerized the world with its supernatural powers. In this episode, we will follow the journey of a keris from the time it is made to how it becomes an object of power sought after by many. What is the source of this attraction to this weapon of war? Is it spiritual, mystical and what happens when a keris has been blood-stained and becomes evil? Tosan Aji, which means respected iron in Javanese, is a prestigious work of etched weapons in Java. The making of the blade is so delicate that the status afforded to it goes beyond that of a normal sword and knife. In the case of a keris, spiritual elements are closely associated with both the maker, known as the umpu, and the object itself. What is so special or even paranormal about a keris, especially the ones that appear out of nowhere, which is a common occurrence in Yogyakarta? One month after I built this building in August 2003, someone from Damak came and said an empu or Chris maker met with him in a dream and asked him to hand over a Chris to me. I thought he just wanted money. But the Chris is physically beautiful and it did originate from Majapahit. While I was admiring the Chris, the man mysteriously disappeared and never returned until today to claim for any payment. Saya. I took that keris back to my house and I kept it in my room. The next day, I noticed a very nasty odor coming from my room and I didn't know why. Was it because of that keris? In this episode, I will be searching for answers about the mysteries of the keris in Yogyakarta by speaking to the royal family of Surakarta, researchers, keris makers and also collectors of this mystical dagger. Accepted and revered as more than a tactical weapon, the Keris, which is a popular heirloom in Java, has deep spiritual and philosophical meanings to the Javanese based on the answers of these experts and researchers. My first guest is the Royal Princess of Surakarta in Solo, Gusti Kanjing Ratu Wandansari. I would like to understand, Princess, what is a royal heirloom? Di Kraton Surakarta. To the lay people, an heirloom is properly limited to an object like a Keris or a spear. But to the royal family, even this palace, the constitution, the laws, the arts and culture all form part of our heritage, which is an heirloom bestowed upon us by our founding king, Penempahan Senopati. Jawa memiliki satu bentuk pusaka. In Jawa, amongst all the heirlooms or pusaka, the Chris is unique. It is sacred and also the heartbeat and the soul of the Jawa. It is not a symbol, an accessory or a lifestyle, but an integrated code of conduct that is respected and adhered to forever. I'm going to speak with an author and researcher, Kijuru Bangunjiwo, who has written an interesting book about the mystery of Suharto's Keris. What are his opinions about the mystical influence of the Keris? Nasihat Luhur The Keris is no longer used to attack or to defend. It is now a noble spiritual mirror of man and it is used to control our inner desire to rule and to take over this world based on our greed. The crease is crafted to reflect harmonious living with nature. In your um, research and in writing this book, are you saying that a lot of um, past President Sohato's power comes from his heirloom of Keris? No, that is not what I am saying. What I want to convey is Suharto's strict spiritual practice and conduct that are aligned to the meaning of the Chris. 
which is harmony and higher wisdom. The crease is to symbolize man's constant seeking for God that leads every man to victory. So far, we are exposed to the external uses and meanings of a kuris that are well accepted by the royalty, political leaders and the general public of Java. But it does not answer my curiosity on why is a kuris so magical and mysterious? What is the source of its power? Where does the kuris get the power or the energy? The Empu or the Chris Maker observes a series of spiritual rules from fasting to meditation to ensure that the energies of this dagger are pure and uncontaminated. He does not make the Chris when his emotions are unstable. A Chris is born through employing the right spiritual methods and by using the right materials, which is very different from how a kitchen knife is made. This makes a Chris powerful and the energy everlasting. Jadi keris ini hanyalah alat. The kris is just a tool or vessel to contain the prayers and wishes of our forefathers, and these wishes are passed on to the future generations. The prayers are infused by the ampu under stringent spiritual conditions. But for the wishes to work, the owner must act in harmony with the prayers of the kris. Once this synchronization is fulfilled, the harmonization will result in an incredible power. I met with a highly regarded Karis maker, Umpu Sungkowo, who has been an Umpu for 30 years. He is the son of a very popular and skilled swordsmith, Umpu Jeno Harum Brojo, a royalty and the 17th Umpu in line of the Super Majapahit lineage. The making of a Karis must be based on faith. In Java, the Empu needs to meditate and fast and ask God for guidance and blessings so that the entire ritual is done safely. An Empu can only work on one Karis each time and it is customised for the person who comes to ask for it. It could take one to six months to complete a Karis as some blades are forged and folded over 4,000 times under extreme heat. How would you know if this curries that you are making is suitable for that person who's asking you to make the curries. When a person who commissions for a curries comes to see me, I will ask for his date of birth and profession. From there, I will also observe his character through astrology. After finding out his personality, I will decide on the material that will be used to forge a curries that is only meant for him. The Kuris blade is forged using four elements, namely earth, wind, water, fire, under extreme temperature of 1400 Celsius and above. The blade is folded thousands of times. The more times, the more refined and aesthetic the design will be. The three metals used in Kuris making are iron, steel and palm oil, or meteorite, each with a specific function, with the steel providing the sharpness and the meteorite the design, while the iron, which easily weighs 12 kilos, would dissipate into ashes. The blade would finally be reduced to just 300 to 400 grams. It is known in the art of metallurgy that these materials do not mix together chemically. Thus, the Kuris blade is really of high value and difficult to make. Technicalities aside, I did have one crucial question for Umbu Sungkowo. So how does a curry get passed down from generation to generation as an heirloom when obviously there's no guarantee that people of the same generation or family is the same character? A curry can be passed on from one generation to another provided that the beneficiary has a similar character with his ancestor. In some cases, there are clashes in personalities and the curry cannot be inherited as, as such. The curries is only kept for collection. After examining how a curries is made and the spiritual role played by the Umpu, it is quite clear that the mystical dimensions of a curries are strong, especially once I learned that the curries is made specifically for an individual to match his energies. Once this person passes away, what becomes of the curries may be 300 years later. It may add up with a curries buyer whose energy is not compatible. I was told that bad things can happen to this unfortunate new owner. We found out that the Chris had already killed two of his previous owners.
this curries has a history of protecting the southern region of Gunung Merapi. The name of the Chris is Satrio Pinang Dito, with 41 waves or look that is forged and folded for more than 3,000 times. It was the Chris of Sheikh Jumaldil Kubra who was asked to guard the southern side of the Gunung Merapi, which faces the royal palace in Yogyakarta for 500 years. Sheikh prayed plunged the Chris into the ground and created an invisible barrier to prevent the eruptions from destroying the palace. And in 2010, the Chris mysteriously came to me. Why and how? I don't know because it is God's will. To me, the Chris is not an object that I worship, but I appreciate its historical and anthropological values. The story told by Gusnas about how the sacred curries came to him is not uncommon in Yogyakarta, especially amongst a community of spiritual practitioners. But for now, I would like to explore more regarding what happens when the energies between man and dagger are not in harmony. What does Mas Bagus, a gifted umpu and accomplished anthropologist, have to say about this? What will happen if this curries and me are not compatible? The energy does not match. There are three ways on how you can own a curis. The first case relates to the curis that you ordered from an umpu. If it is not compatible with you, then we have to question the umpu. As for the second one, I personally have never heard of stories about a curis that was handed down from generation to generation, which is not compatible with the next owner. But most of the time, the case is the third one. When you buy a curis, or you were given a curse by someone. This is when the incompatibility of the curse with your character often occurs. What are the symptoms? Do they get sick? Do they get angry? Do they change? All the facts that you have just mentioned, all of them can occur actually. Someone can change his characters. He can become angry easily or something like that. The effects can be bad and death can also happen. I was informed that a healer and mystic by the name of Pak Sabdo has recorded a video of a ceremony he conducted to identify and remove the negativity that was embedded in a keris. Someone from Kalimantan showed me the keris and said there are problems with it. Through a medium, I was able to communicate with a spirit that was planted into the keris. We found out that the keris had already killed two of its previous owners. The spirit is a kodam, or a slave of the person who created the Chris about 1,300 years ago. He was very powerful and he made a promise to the spirit that it will be released after his job was done, but the owner did not keep his words. Many people do not know the characteristics of the Chris that they own because they are attracted to the physical appearance of the Chris. Therefore, it doesn't mean that the Chris is evil but it is the characteristics of the Chris that are not suitable or compatible with the new owners. We must not desire for a very powerful Chris out of grief and pay a high price in order to get it. These may bring problems later. If the Chris is powerful, but the prayers of the Umpu are pure, strong and righteous, the Chris itself will look for a new owner and appear by itself to him. Perhaps this explains why certain sacred curries appears out of thin air to sincere and rightful owners, possibly of a similar ancestral lineage. What is common is that these owners are very humble and almost secretive about these mysterious heirlooms. However, sometimes we can be gifted a curries that turned out to be an heirloom of doom. Mas Bagus, can you share with me stories of to the person or to the people that's around this evil Chris. As a descendant of the palace of Surakarta, I inherited more than 200 Kuris from my grandfather. One day, I purchased a very beautiful and golden Kuris from someone. So I took that Kuris back to my house and I kept it in my room. The next day, I noticed a very nasty odor coming from my room and I didn't know why. Was it because of that Kuris? I removed the Kuris from my room and placed it in my brother's room. The odour disappeared, but it moved to the new room. 
Then I realized the curries had not been cleansed yet through the jamasan process. So after I conducted the jamasan, I noticed that the curries might have been used to do bad things because blood had been spilled into these curries. It cannot be cleansed. So at that time in 2004, I conducted the Palarongan ritual on the curries, which is to dispose it into the sea. That was the only way. After listening to Mas Bagus' true account of accidentally picking a karis that has been stained with blood, in the next segment we will witness how a karis is cleansed of any negative energies and entities that might be living in there. The downfall of a karis can be easily brought about by wrongful worship, even if it started with honour. And in 2010, the Chris mysteriously came to me. Why and how? I don't know because it is God's will. The next day, I noticed a very nasty odor coming from my room, and I didn't know why. Pada Chris, itu merupakan lambang kuasa. To me, Chris is a symbol of power, like it is seen to symbolize the sovereignty of the king. Therefore, the Chris is not mystical unless it is praised and worshipped with incense, and as a result, it becomes mystical. If they are not, I collect hundreds of Chris. Nothing strange has happened. As a collector, although I don't practice mysticism, the previous owners of the Chris might have been worshipping it. So whenever I buy an old Chris, I never bring it into the house on the first day. I leave it outside and I observe if there are any changes in the family. For example, is there disharmony or sudden arguments? If there is, I will cleanse the Chris first and make sure that the connection is broken with the previous owner. But if a Chris is not meant to be mine, I will sell it back to the former owner or give it away. I reject any form of mystical elements in a Chris. The journey of a Chris is indeed complex as there are collectors who reject its spiritual nature and I wonder if the Chris had been brought to life through all these stories, prayers, wishes, incantations and rituals performed by us humans. Nevertheless, a spiritual keeper of the Karis is required to perform periodic ceremonial cleansing to ensure that they are both physically and spiritually healthy, as explained by Mas Bagus. Can you explain to me uh, what is this cleaning process? What is it called and what does it mean? Jamasan. So this process is called Jamasan. The word Jamas means to clean or to purify. There are three steps in the Jamasan. The first one is the whitening process or cleaning process, just like the one that we see here. And the second process is to sun dry the curries. And then the last process is known as the warangan. Through warangan, we soak the curries in an arsenic solution. So warang is a natural stone of arsenics. And then we combine this with lime water and then we apply the concoction to the curries to give it a new application. On the average, how long do you normally put it in the sun? If the sunlight is good, 15 minutes will be enough. We dry it properly so that the arsenic can really be absorbed by the metal. Why do you use arsenic? I mean, isn't it poisonous? The colour of the blade will come out different. The materials that absorb the arsenic will become black while the titanium, nickel and other meteorites will be turning white. Every Friday night, only selected royalties like me, my sister and father are allowed to attend to the albums like the curries. We prepare offerings and cleanse the holy objects ourselves. But on ordinary days, there is an appointed custodian who will look after and clean the place that keeps the royal albums. Can this process that you just explained to me, Jamasan, can it purify if a karis has become evil? The first one, if the karis had already been used to kill someone, if you can smell blood from it, then the only choice is to dispose it into the sea. But there is another option, which is to melt the karis using fire to produce a new one. Is it to be done by the owner or the umpu? An umpu but he is also a human being. We can only try, but if the evil power is still so strong in the Kuris, then the only option is to dispose it into the sea. 
kejujuran itu adalah most people think that if i own this type of curious then i can be powerful if i own that type of curious i can be a person with honor that's a very mistaken belief actually so we need to acknowledge the function of the curious is not like any other weapon it is not produced to kill this weapon is as a reminder about our spirituality about how we are unified with nature Secondly, we also use a combination of special materials to produce a curious. We follow the Popo and Koso concept of the Father's sky and the Ibu Pertiwi or Mother Earth by using meteorites from the sky and nickels, metals from the earth, reminding us of our true nature. The journey of a curious starts with the intention of a person wanting to own a curious to give himself spiritual guidance, confidence, clarity, or even good fortune, and he seeks the noble service of a qualified umpu to make a powerful curious. Once created, the energies in the curious cannot be destroyed; it can only be sedated. What becomes of the fate of this curious is totally unpredictable. Will it be an heirloom, or would it end up in the hands of a greedy owner? Whatever it is, we must remember that the source of true power is always within ourselves and not an object, even one as potent as a curse.